Well, good morning, Coastal. How are you guys doing this morning? You guys doing well? Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is TJ. I'm one of the pastors here. We're glad that you're with us today. We're, we're kind of in between series right now. We're getting ready to roll into a series starting November 5th called The Dilemma. And I, I'm super pumped about this series. We're going to be talking about how do we stand firm and love well in a culture that is... Uh, Let's just say at odds with one another. Anybody notice that like culture like hates itself right now? Like er like everybody's got an opinion, and, and if you don't agree with their opinion, like you hate them. Uh, and so like we're gonna address some of that stuff. We're gonna address what God says about a lot of things, and and kind of find some places where we can stand firm in what God says, but then love people well in the process. And I think that if we can learn how to do that, we'll see God do some some absolutely incredible things. And then uh, next weekend, next weekend you you have the treat of having. Uh, my favorite preacher uh, speaking next weekend. And so my wife, Shayla, is going to be speaking at all of our services next weekend. And so, man, I I'll tell you what, it'll be, it'll be the biggest services at our church because everybody's like, we, we like her a lot better than we like you. So it's, it's all good. I, I, I know that. It's okay. I I'm secure in that at this point. But uh, today, I just want to share with you something that's it's kind of been in my heart for us as a church. And, and, and God's just kind of been stirring up within me for us that I want to challenge us with a little bit today, if that's okay. Um, and, and so let me kind of set this up. Like, I am a person that loves adventure. Uh, like, I, I've loved adventure since I was a little kid. I remember as a kid, like, my, I was always outside playing. I was always outside, like, going into the woods and building forts and exploring. Like, kids today don't even know what the woods are anymore, you know. Like, that, what's, what's the woods? It's a group of trees that you'd go through. Like, don't even worry about it. And, and you know, and you would just go out and you would, you'd be out for hours and you'd, like, lose track of time. But you always knew there was a certain time you had to be home, right? Mama would always tell you, be home by Dark or dinner, depending on what your mama liked, you know. Uh, but you knew when you had to be home, and you would go explore and just do whatever. You want to know who is really adventurous as our kids? Our parents were adventurous because they didn't have a clue where we were. Today, you don't even let your, parent, your kids out of the front yard. Let's just be honest. Like, there's no adventure today. But I, I loved adventure, and, and I still love adventure today. Like, I'm passionate about adventure. In fact, a couple years ago, Shayla and I realized that in the holidays, it's Christmas time, we were buying each other gifts that, that weren't extremely meaningful anymore. And so we, we had a, a decision that we, we said, you know, we're going to stop buying meaningless gifts for one another, and we're going to create experiences with each other. And so we decided every December around Christmas time, we would go somewhere and we'd create a meaningful experience that we would remember for years to come. And we'd gone all over the place. Last year, we went to Washington, D.C. for Christmas and, and walked around all the Smithsonian's and, and just had this amazing, amazing adventure. And so we're always looking for those moments that we can have some sort of adventure. Last year, uh, we, we led a missions trip, uh, a team from our church to South Africa, to Belisha where we have our church there, incredible church going on with almost 500 kids that we're, we're feeding on a daily basis and bringing into the local church. It's incredible what you guys are doing. And so we took this team, and as we were sending them back to America, we decided to stay a couple uh, days later, longer in South Africa. And we traveled to Cape Town for some vacation. And, uh, and we, we went exploring. And I remember we went to the Cape of Good Hope, which is the lowest, southernmost point in, in Africa. And we we're traversing along these cliffs as we're getting to this place and 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 Shayla is terrified of heights like she doesn't like going out on balconies she doesn't like getting to the edge of anything but we we're like walking along the edge and and I was like babe you got to go out and get a selfie uh, like next to the water you like you got to venture out and and she and she got outside of herself and, and in fact we got a picture of her in South Africa here she is about 700 feet above the water on the edge of this cliff, she literally crawled out on her hands and her knees, flipped over, took a selfie, and then like shimmied her way back <laughs> to the edge. But she she had to get the experience. And then we were we were at Table Mountain, and uh, here I am doing like a handstand on Table Mountain because it's overlooking like it's the eighth wonder of the world, is what they say. It's a new new one of the wonders of the world. And so we were there, and and as we were in South Africa, Shayla's like. Hey, I heard they have really cool, great white shark cage diving here. Would you be interested in going? And if you know me at all, 
I'm an adrenaline junkie. If it's stupid and death-defying, I'm in. Like, sign me up. And, and so I was like, of course. And she's like, that's good because I already paid for it. And I'm like, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and finds some favor from the Lord. Hallelujah. And so I was like, man, that's awesome. And it's like, that's, that's a win right there. And so uh, it was later on in the week. And, and so I drove over to this other side. And, and uh, I got to this 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 boat and they say hey we're gonna we're gonna drive out to this place called seal island and i was like why why are we gonna go there and they're like well because great white sharks like to eat seals i was like oh that makes sense and they're like we're gonna put you in this black wetsuit and i'm like that looks like a seal <laughs> and they're like yes actually nobody's ever said that i'm like that's because nobody's been thinking yet i know i see what's going on you're gonna make me a giant seal i see how you lower them in i got plenty of blubber so it's good you know um and we'd go out on this boat, and there's a, there's a group of people that have paid hundreds of dollars to go on this expedition. And we actually got some, some video of it, if you guys want to show them real quick. Uh, sorry, this is kind of blurry. This is from my iPhone. This is actually like a 10 to 12 foot great white shark. It weighs about a ton, 2,000 pounds. Here I am inside the, the cage, and here's a great white. And that's how that boom, that was him hitting the cage. And what you couldn't hear was me peeing my pants. <laughs> oh, man, that was huge. They, <laughs> I was like, that thing was huge. The, the, the God up top, when I got out of the cage, uh, he told me that was a 14 to 16 foot great white shark that weighed anywhere from two to three tons. He was about uh, a third of the length of a full size school bus. And, uh, and, and, and I'll tell you what, when that, when that dude hit that cage, like, I was scared. I was like, oh, that is big, you know? And, and, and when I peed my pants, like, not only was I scared, but it warmed me up because it was about 30 degrees. It was, like, the, the best thing that happened at that moment. <laughs> but it was a crazy adventure. And here's what I know about all of us is God has got an adventure for every single one of us. And he's placed adventure inside of every single one of us. And he has something for you. He's got a purpose and he's got a plan for your life. And a lot of us have just never ventured out to figure out what that is. In fact, in, in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, it, it says this. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's wombs. Before you were born, I set you apart. The word knew there is, is the Hebrew word yada. And the word he, yada actually means to know deeply, to know intimately. And what God is saying is he's saying like, I know the deepest parts of who you are. In fact, I formed them that way. I birthed you that way. I created you that way to have this deep desire to do something great for me. And I've put it in you and you're to live that thing out. And you're not just to live a boring, ordinary life. I've got an extraordinary life for you. In fact, God calls us his masterpiece in Ephesians 2, verse 10, it says, for we are God's masterpiece. Everybody say, I'm God's masterpiece. Okay, I saw a lot of you not moving your mouse. Okay, we're going to try this again. Say, I'm God's masterpiece. Okay, I still see people. I can stay here all day. I've got time. Say, I'm God's masterpiece. See, Susie just gets louder every time I say it. I just like it. That's the that's funny part. She's like, if I just speak louder, that he'll think more people know. Uh, you're God's masterpiece. If you're God's masterpiece, then that means that God's got a master plan. And it's time for some of us to realize that God has called each and every one of us to something great. He's got a purpose. He's got an intentionality to our lives, and we have got to search out the depths of us to figure out what that thing is. Let me just plug this. Six o'clock tonight, we have our Discover event. If you've never been to it, this is an opportunity for you to start to figure out how God designed you and how he created you and what are some of the gifts that he's given you that will help you start to put some, some uh, 
some skin to some dreams that are out there. And so I would encourage you to come tonight to our church office at 6 o'clock. We have child care. We'll have food. We'd love to have you be a part of it. Uh, and, and so just shameless plug right there. Quick question. How many of you love adventure? Show of hands. If you love adventure, raise your hands. Keep them up. Keep them up. Okay. If you want to go on an adventure right now, stand up. Stand up. Count of three. One, two, three. Nobody else stand. Nobody else stand because you're a late adopter at this point. Like you're just following everybody else. Okay, everybody that raised their hand that said they wanted to go on an adventure that's still sitting, uh, raise your hand again. Raise it up, raise it up. Come on, come on, raise it up. Raise it up high. Don't be ashamed. It's okay. Just leave it up there. I want you to notice there's, there's three different groups of people in here. There's the people that didn't raise their hands at all that are sitting like this and they're like, uh-uh, I ain't going on an adventure. And these are the people that when they go to Chick-fil-A, they order the same meal every single time. I'm going to have a number one. And I want it with a sweet tea and two ketchups. No, 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 don't sit down, don't sit down, don't bend down. Come on, come on. Then there's the second group, come on, raise your hands again. That, that You said you want an adventure, but you're still sitting, come on. You're like, I love adventure, but I don't like standing. You know, that's those people. And then there's the third group. I, I want you to notice how many people are standing up here. You want to know why there's this many people standing up? Because the people at Coastal Community Church are crazy. That's why. This is the crazy group. This is my people right here. That's what I'm talking about, my people. I don't even know you, but we're peoples. So you all can sit down. I just want to take a, like, it's important. Now, now stay away from those people that were standing. They're crazy. They, they will do this. They will, they will mess you up. Here's what I know about most of us. Over time, most of us it'll lose that adventurous spirit. It starts to deteriorate within us. We used to be adventurous, but... Not really so much anymore. Because we bind to this idea that, that life is about how can I build safety and how can I build predictability to my life. And instead of pursuing adventure, we settle for routine. In fact, some of us in the beginning of this year, we said, this is a new year. And we declared that this year is going to be different. And three quarters of the way through 2017, it looks exactly like 2016, and 2015, and 2014, and 2009, and 2002, and 1987 for some of us. And my question for us, church, is why do we stay in routines that God has called us out of? If God has called each and every one of us to something great, why do we settle for less than when we have a God of more than? And here's what I know about us. Your biggest regret at the end of your life won't be the things you did. It'll be the things you wish you would have. Your biggest regret won't be the things that you did do. It'll be the things that you wish you would have stepped out and done in your life. In fact, Cornell University did some research, and this is what they said. They said when people look at the whole of their lives, inaction regrets outnumber action regrets 84 to 16%. So what they say is, is, as much as you say to yourself, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that, 84% more of the time you're going to go, man, I wish I would have. I wish I would have gone on that mission trip. I wish I would have trusted God. I wish I would have asked that girl out on a date. I wish I would have gone for that job promotion. I wish I would have served people more in my life. I wish I would have been a little bit taller or a baller. Or had a girl that looked good who I could call her. <laughs> Ski low. Yeah. So if you know you're going to regret it, if you know you're going to regret things in life, why stay the way you are? Why do we abandon the purpose that God has given us instead of living for it? I think there's a couple reasons. One of them, if you're taking notes, A there is is we just discard our dreams. We have discarded dreams. And somewhere along the way, we stop dreaming. And I think we all start off with the dream, and, and we probably tell somebody, and because those people discouraged our dreams, we abandon them. And somewhere pain happens in our life, and our pain replaces our purpose. 
And because we have pain, we start looking for safety and security. And we just try to endure life instead of living it. In fact, I, I, I'm about to turn 39 years old, which means I, I'm pushing 40. And so I'm starting to read books about men that are 40 years old because I want to prepare myself for that milestone in life. It's a big deal to me. I don't know what they, I, like I already went balding and that was premature. And so I don't want to do any other premature things. And so I, I was reading and, and I was reading this book and it, it, they, there was this line that just, that just messed me up. It says, when men hit 40, they start to close doors to rooms that they will never go back into again. And I don't know about you, church, but I don't want to close doors to dreams that God hasn't done yet. I don't, want to, I, don't want to, I don't want to get to the end of my life and die before I'm done. Like, I believe that God has still has something great inside of me, and I believe that God has still got something great inside of you. And we've got to pursue that purpose with everything that we've got, and we can't just discard those dreams because we had a bad day. Or we endured some pain in life. Because listen, all of us are going to have those kind of days. All of us are going to have those kind of moments. And we're not the only ones that have it. Job, in Job chapter 17, had one of those moments. He had lost his wealth. He had lost his kids. His, his wife had told him, man, why don't you just curse God and die? So he was in a troubled marriage. And this is what he says in Job 17, 11. My days are over. My hopes are have disappeared. My heart's desires are broken. But God wasn't finished with Job even when he thought God was done with him. And a lot of us give up on God before God has given up on us. And if we give up in the middle of a trial or if we give up in the middle of pain, that trial and that pain a lot of times is preparing us for our purpose in life. And we just need to push through those moments. And I just want to encourage you, church, don't give up when you're in the middle of getting where you're going. Don't just put your life on autopilot and endure life. And I believe that a lot of us in here today are living on autopilot. We're just going through life, just letting the days pass us by. And we're like, we can go through a day and like, hey, how was your day? And you got the same responses every single day. What'd you do today? I got up. I drank a cup of coffee. I drove to work. I worked. I came home, I watched TV, I turned it off, I went to bed. Every day. We have autopilot responses to things. I'll give you an example. Hey, how are you doing? Fine. Right? We have autopilot. We don't really want that person to tell us how they're doing. Like if they go, well, since you ask, actually, I'm having a terrible. No, don't tell me how you're doing. I was just, that was just a, I was just being considerate and nice. I don't really want to hear. Right? Why? Because we're just living life on autopilot. And a lot of us, we've just settled into a routine that God never designed us to live in. In fact, some of us have built homes where God only wanted us to put up a tent. Because we are never supposed to stay there. In fact, the definition of autopilot is this. A device that provides steering in place of a person. Some of us are just steering through life. Not really living because we've discarded our dreams. B is some of us, we have distracted vision. We have a place where we're supposed to be, but we can't see it anymore because there's so much going on in life. There's so much distracting us. From what's happening. In fact, uh, uh, like last year, beginning of last year in 2016, uh, we had taken our staff to Dallas for a conference, and we were in this 15-passenger van, and I was I was driving our staff, and our, our staff is kind of a rambunctious group, and, and they're loud. I mean, we got Susie on our team, and, and like, she's loud, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. So, and so they're all back there. They're like, they're making all this noise in the backseat. I'm trying to get my way to this conference. And I remember, and parents, you can probably relate to this. I remember yelling back to the back of the van, would you guys be quiet? I can't see where I'm going. I didn't know that hearing had anything to do with seeing, but, but actually it has a lot to do with seeing. 
In fact, your brain's visual cortex delivers information from your ears to your brain to give you an image for where you're going, according to the University of Glasgow. It says, sounds create visual imagery, mental images, and automatic projections. Sounds create mental imagery. They, they, they say this. They say, for example, they say, if, if you hear the sound of a motorcycle and you're on the side, if you're on a sidewalk, what you start doing is you start anticipating a motorcycle coming around the corner, don't you? Because what you hear, you start to visualize. I'll give you another example that you see happen all the time. You hear, coming from above. What do you start doing? You start looking around for the airplane, right? Why? Because sounds create visual imagery. The reason I tell you that is because some of us have been listening to the wrong voices. And because we've been listening to the wrong voices, our minds have created a wrong idea of what God wants for our lives because we've been pursuing the wrong thing. All because the wrong voices have gotten into our head. And God wants to totally reshape the voices that are coming at us. And he wants to give us a clear and decisive vision and purpose for our lives. That's one of the reasons why we tell you, get into a connect group. Get into a connect group. Not because we want you in a connect group. Why? Because we want you to have good voices in your life. We want you to have people that are, that are telling you, man, God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. Keep pursuing him. So how do we start to disseminate what is distracting our vision? Jesus gives us a great story in Matthew 17, 14 through 21. I'll, I won't read it all to you, but I'll tell it to you basically. It's there in your notes. Basically, Jesus goes, hey, uh, is, is doing some teaching. His disciples have been out praying for people. A guy comes to Jesus and says, hey, my boy, your disciples prayed for my boy, but my boy was not healed. And so my boy is demon possessed. He keeps throwing himself into fires. And Jesus looks at his disciples and looks at all the people around them and says, you faithless and corrupt people. Then he prays for this little boy to be healed. The boy gets healed. He continues to teach. When everybody leaves, the disciples go, Jesus, what's the deal? Why couldn't we heal the boy? And Jesus tells them, you couldn't heal the boy because this kind of demon does not come out except through prayer and fasting. And so in this passage of scripture, Jesus gives us the problem and he gives us the solution. He says, man, you faithless and corrupt generation faithless. What does that mean? You're disconnected from God. Corrupt. That means you're connected to the world. He says, how, do, how does that change? How do you get past that? What you have to do is you have to pray and you have to fast. What does praying do? It connects you to God. What does fasting do? It disconnects you from the world. And Jesus is saying, man, you want to get a vision for your life. You have to disconnect from the world and connect to me. You got to connect to me. So what does that mean? Some of us, we need to change some relationships. Some of us need to get off Facebook and get a God's book. Stop listening to those haters out there. We don't need their input. We need God's word. I, I could preach right there, but we're just going to go to letter C. Some of us, were facing some disbelief in life. Somewhere along the way, we just say, man, it's just not possible for God to do something great with me. We think that because of what we've done or where we've been or what's happened to us, it's disqualified us. Just this past Monday, we, uh, Shayla and I, it's our day off, we, we went shopping at Sawgrass Mills Mall, which is basically like going to hell on earth, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> and, and so we were walking around Sawgrass Mills Mall, we were in a store, and we were, Shayla was over in the women's section, I was, I was in the guys' section, I was, I was done looking at stuff, and so I, I went to go look for Shayla, and I saw her across the store, and so I walked up, and because I'm, I still date my wife, I walked up, and I'm like, I'm going to spit some game on her, and I was like, she was, she was looking at something, so I walked up from behind her, I'm like, hey, baby, what's up? You look good, you know, I just, I was being sweet and just, just soulful, uh, and like, and, and, and uh, as I was talking to her, uh, she turns around, except it, it's not her. Anybody ever have one of those moments? Like, it's not a good moment. She, she just recently changed her hairstyle, so that kind of messed me up a little bit. It's, it's like her former hairstyle. I was like, oh, snap, this girl was about the same height, same, same build. Every, I was like, normally I would have gone up and slapped her butt or something. So I was like, oh, I'm glad I didn't do that. I could just say, pastor is arrested for, you know. Uh, kind of had a little bit of a mistaken identity there. It was not a, was not a good day for me. Um, 
Here's the good news. Uh, not about that story, but uh, God never gets a case of mistaken identity. God knows who he calls, and he calls who he knows. He called you, and he did not make a mistake. And he's called you to an incredible, passion-filled life. All you got to do is answer the call. But here's the goal of the enemy. The goal of the enemy is to get us disqualified. Listen, when you're blinded to the possibilities of your future, you'll settle for the familiarities of your past. The reason we were at the mall on Monday is because the week before, we had a tragedy in our home. Um, my favorite pair of jeans, I, I had a blowout in my crotch. You know, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, where it just rips in half, and it's like, and it was my favorite pair of jeans. And, and like, I love them. In fact, I own multiple pairs of the same jeans. And so, like, this was the second time I'd blown out the, the crotch in one of them. And I was like, hey. Uh, and so, we, we were out last week, and I was wearing them. And Shayla looked down, and she's like, are those the jeans that have the hole in the crotch? I'm like, yes, but they're so comfortable, babe. And she's like, you've got to retire those. And I'm like, but they're breezy, you know, and uh, she's like, I don't care, we're done with those, and I was like, well, then we need to get some other ones, so I'm wearing some new jeans today, <laughs> you know, let me just, uh, and, and so, and so, <laughs> like, we, we, ha we had to retire those, uh, but I love those jeans, because they're comfortable, they just fit well. Crazy thing is, is I think we do that in life. We're sitting in an old mentality when God has called us to something new. And the holes that have happened through life aren't going to help us. They're going to hinder us if we stay in that place. And God says, I've got something new for you, and you need to step into a new experience instead of living in your old one. So how do we discard those mentalities and move forward? Number one, if you're taking notes, man, you've got to start to believe again. You've got to believe that God called you and can use you and I know that you're going to tell me well you don't know what's happened you don't know how many mistakes I've made you don't know how bad I've messed up L listen listen you need to hear this good thing God isn't looking for perfection all he's looking for is some progress he's looking for you to take a step he's not asking you to take 37 steps he's saying hey today why don't you just take one step I mean, all you got to do is look at the 12 disciples to realize that, that God isn't, isn't looking for the most qualified people. In fact, if you were to look at the 12 disciples, you would realize that they were rejected by society. They were rejected by man. They were working in their father's businesses, which meant that when rabbis looked at them, they said, they're not good enough. They're not qualified to be on this level. They're just going to be average, normal, mundane people. And Jesus looked at what the world called average or less than and says, hey, I want you. I'm calling you. And you know what Jesus is saying to you today? He's saying, hey, I call you. Hey, I call you. I don't care what the world says. I call you. And Peter and John, they took that call literally. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, they're out doing some incredible things. And it says, the member of the council, the, the, the really smart people, the Sanhedrin, were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men. That word ordinary men in the Greek is translated as idiota. You know what that stands for in our English language? Idiots. So they said, hey, we recognize that these dudes are idiots. They were amazed that, that God could use idiots. You want to know why God can use idiots? Because it's at the end of this verse. It says they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Listen, you don't have to have it all together. All you got to do is get and spend some time with Jesus and believe that he can use you. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And he's called every single one of us to live out the adventure. And the closer you get to Jesus, the more that you're going to realize that he's got something personally for you. And that's going to start to awaken within your spirit. And all of a sudden you're going to be like, man, I, I can't live without doing this thing. And when that starts to happen, what you need to do is, number two, you need to go all in. Go all in. 
You're going to say, God, man, with everything that I got, man, I'm diving in. Hook, line, and sinker. Man, I'm all in for you. I don't care what you ask. I don't care where you call me to go. Man, I'm going all in for you. And I remember when, I, when, I, when we made this decision as a church, I remember we were about less than a year old. We probably had 90 people showing up at church, and, and, and God started birthing this idea that these kids in Collier City, they needed, they needed backpacks and school supplies to go back to school if they're ever going to be able to break the cycle that was going on in their life. And I was like, man, as a church, we're going to do that. We're gonna, I went to a local school. Day, I was like, how many backpacks and school supplies do you need? They're like, we probably need a thousand. I was like, okay, we have 90 people. I don't, the math there doesn't work. And so we came up with this idea. We're, we're going to get at this lift, the 60 foot lift. I'm going to go live in there until we raise a thousand backpacks and school supplies for kids. Great idea. God ideas sound awesome until you start them. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I remember what it is, is a, it, I forget what day it was. It was about 7 o'clock at night. I started going up in this lift. We had this big poster that said, or a banner that said raising 1,000 backpacks for uh, uh, Collier City kids uh, and school supplies. And, and that first night, we had a torrential downpour. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a 60-foot lift without like an umbrella or a rain jacket in a, in a torrential downpour with lightning, but not the smartest move. And then, uh, and so I was freezing my my butt off, honestly. And then the next day was like the hottest day of summer. It was like 100 degrees out. And and that day, instead of being freezing cold, I got sunburned. And and by the end of that day, we had raised about 12 backpacks. I was like, Jesus, we're killing it right now. (laughs) God, please show up. I don't want to stay up here. And, uh, but I say, God, no matter what, I'm all in. If I got to stay up here two weeks, I'll stay up here two weeks. If I got to stay up here two months, I'll stay up here two months. And, and I told him I, I, I was not eating anything during that time because I didn't have anywhere to go number two. So we're, we're just sticking to fluids. And uh, 56 hours later, we'd raised over 2,000 backpacks and school spots for inner city kids. Why? Because we were willing to go all in. We are willing to become foolish for God. Because here's the deal. You can never build God's reputation if you're worrying about your own. Some of y'all need to hear that today. You're really worried about, well, what do people think? Who gives a rip what people think? They're not thinking about you anyways. They're thinking, what do people think about me? They're thinking about themselves. Start building God's reputation. Watch your reputation get built. One of my favorite stories in the New Testament is the story of the five loaves and two fish. And it's a story where Jesus is teaching, and uh, there's about 5,000 men, the Bible says, which equals 20 to 25,000 men, women, and children. And uh, at the end of the day, his disciples are getting hungry, and so they come to Jesus and said, hey, why don't you send the people away so they can go get something to eat because we don't have food to feed them. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, hey, you feed them. His disciples are like, say what? You know, they're just like, I, I'm not sure you, you understood what we said. He's like, no, 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 you, y'all feed them. And so they go back and they go and they grab what they have, which isn't much. Basically, they steal a, a doggy bag of five loaves and two fish from the kid that went to Long John Silver's, which is a terrible, terrible <laughs> meal in and of itself. And so they bring it to Jesus and say, hey, we, we don't have enough to feed these people. All we got are these five loaves and two fish. You know what Jesus says? He says, that's enough. Give it to me, which is number three. Whatever you have, you just got to put it in the hands of Jesus. You want to fulfill the adventure that God has for your life. You just got to put what you have in the hands of Jesus. And Jesus takes those five loaves and those two fish. He breaks it and he blesses it and he puts it back in the hands of the disciples. And they go out and they feed the 20,000 people. And they end up having 12 basketfuls left over. Here's what I know about life is that people always come up with excuses. I'm not talented enough. I don't have the skills. I don't have enough money. I don't have the influence. Listen, whatever you have is enough in the hands of Jesus. Stop disqualifying yourself. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, it says, in everything Jesus is in everything, so all we have to do is give him something, and he can create everything out of it. And I know that some of you are thinking about your own life, and you're like, God, I don't have anything to offer. You have you. And if you would just say, God, here I am. Like, I give you what I have, and I'm willing to step out. Man, I promise you, God will start to show up.
In fact, I love uh, the Acts 10, 35, uh, the second part of that, I put a whole bunch more in there. It says, it makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, the door is open. Susie, if you want to make your way up. Listen, it makes no difference who you are or where you've been or what you've done. If you want God and you want to pursue the purpose and plan that he has for your life, God says, the door is open. It's not closed. It's not shut off. All we have to do is step through. All we have to do is take that step. It says if we draw near to God, we got to take the first step. He'll draw near to us. Some of us, is, it's time for us to walk through the door. It's time for some of us to take the step. It's time for some of us to Stop living out of memory. Start living out of the imagination that God has for us. Would you guys bow your heads and pray?